Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Swanson. I serve as a, a pastor here at Kern Road Mennonite Church. On behalf of the Kern Road congregation, I'd like to welcome you, both those here in person and those joining us online, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we as a congregation are so grateful and so excited to be able to host this event sponsored by Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart. Uh, we as a congregation are fortunate enough to have Drew Strait, our speaker for tonight, and his family as part of our congregation. And last fall, we were fortunate enough to have Drew lead a 12-week Sunday school class on resisting Christian nationalism. Uh, as a pastor, uh, I was really excited for this uh, discussion because I've been paying attention to Christian nationalism and its influence on the church at large, as well as within the United States. And I was really grateful for uh, our congregation to be able to engage in this conversation. But a few weeks in, I had one regret. And that was that we weren't recording it <laughs> because Drew was giving us like straight gold for 12 weeks. And quite frankly, I wanted to share it with all of my friends that weren't able to join us in person. Uh, lucky for us, though, uh, Drew decided to just go ahead and write a book for all of us with all of his material in it. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to read Drew's book, Strange Worship, Six Steps for Challenging Christian Nationalism, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, it's such a helpful and profound um, book for this particular moment that we find ourselves in. And uh, they will be available after the lecture tonight, and there'll be a book signing as well, uh, which is what brings all of us here tonight, this lecture, yeah, uh, to hear and to learn from Drew as he shares about how to challenge Christian nationalism, building peace in an age of extremism. Uh, one quick housekeeping note before we get started, uh, we do ask that you uh, please silence your cell phones as we get started. And before we hear from Drew, I'd like to welcome David Beauchart, president of AMBS, to share a few words. Thank you, Sean. Along with Drew's fan club of colleagues here in the front, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Drew Strait to you this evening as a colleague and friend at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Drew Strait is a dad, a pastor theologian, speaker, and professor. His writing and teaching focuses on political idolatry and peacemaking in early Christianity. Dr. Strait is a, pro a popular speaker on how faith communities can challenge Christian nationalism, violent extremism, and Christian supremacy with strategic nonviolence. Dr. Strait was baptized Catholic, raised United Methodist, discipled as an evangelical through Young Life, reformed through the Whitworth College, and became a convinced Anabaptist after a transformative rereading of the Gospels after the Iraq War. This widely ecumenical background energizes Dr. Strait's passion to bring together diverse coalitions of Christians to bear witness to God's mission of reconciliation, to reconcile humans to God and humans to one another. Dr. Strait's new book, Strange Worship, Six Steps for Challenging Christian Nationalism, was many years in the making, beginning with his doctoral dissertation on political idolatry in early Christianity. Strange Worship, Six Steps for Challenging Christian Nationalism now emerges as an important resource for the church for this time and this place. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Drew Strait. Thank you so much, David. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude by the support I've experienced from Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary over the past four years as I've been working on this project. I also wanna thank everyone who's here in person tonight and online and those who watch the recording of this lecture. My heart is full as I see your faces and as we think about mobilizing a challenger movement against Christian nationalism. Writing a book on Christian nationalism is a humbling experience. Humbling because the topic is volatile and complex and no one singular person can possibly offer the path forward. It is out of this space that I discovered one of the central arguments of strange worship. We need a leaderful movement to challenge white Christian nationalism. On our own, we don't have very much power, but together, we are powerful. 
My hope and prayer for all of us in this room and online is that we can help amplify the ever-growing chorus of leaderful voices in literature challenging Christian nationalism in the United States and abroad. It's not lost on me that there is an idea out there that Christian leaders are not supposed to talk about politics in church or show partisan allegiances. I understand these dynamics well. I am, after all, a seminary professor, but I also think that Christians are called to be truth tellers in the face of fascism, political idolatry, and threats to human flourishing. So I want to acknowledge tonight that I am biased, and my bias is this. I believe that the life and teachings of Jesus are incompatible with the values of white Christian nationalism. I also believe that Christian nationalism presents an immediate threat to democracy, the global church's integrity, our climate, and human security. And so I come at this fraught topic tonight not as a partisan hack, but as a follower of Jesus, a pastor, a Bible professor, and a father of three young children for whom I am deeply concerned about the world that they are inheriting. For the next 50 or so minutes, I'd like to share some things I've learned about challenging Christian nationalism with you from over the past four years of working with hundreds of Christians all around the world. It's hard for me to believe that it's been almost 10 years since former President Donald Trump rode down his golden escalator to begin his presidential campaign. Since 2015, scholars and pundits of all sorts have debated how and whether to apply the term fascism to the U.S.'s growing movement of white Christian nationalism with its ultra-nationalist politics in the MAGA wing of the Republican Party. While we cannot settle that debate tonight, one cannot deny that reality for all Americans has become distorted by and entangled in various forms of fascist politics. This includes the polarization and division of Americans through right-wing appeals to a mythic past, propaganda, anti-intellectualism, unreality, hierarchy, victimhood, law and order, sexual anxiety, appeals to the heartland, and a dismantling of public welfare and unity. These 10 mechanisms of fascist politics, according to author Jason Stanley, build on one another and are interconnected in a way that they normalize and trance the morally extraordinary into the ordinary. I don't know about you all, but the past 10 years have felt exhausting as division and the morally extraordinary becomes ordinary. As Stanley argues, uh, the most telling symptom of fascist politics is division. To illustrate this, just two weeks ago, at an upscale retirement community in San Francisco, they witnessed two of its female residents engage in a fist fight on the pickleball court over the presidential election. Eyewitnesses report that the elderly women left one another's hair on the court. On the day of this altercation, it just so happened that I was lecturing on Christian nationalism to another retirement community of over 700 people on the East Coast. When I arrived, I was shocked to learn that this community was a microcosm of our country's polarization. For a full day, I sat with residents who shared stories of fractured relationships and about neighbors who had been radicalized on social media. Some re residents were even moved to tears as they were sharing these stories with me. A few hours into my visit there, the executives pulled me aside into their offices and actually and kind of vetted my material to make sure I wasn't there to further divide their community. This retirement community even had to put a moratorium on placing political signs outside of people's apartments and they had to prohibit people from wearing MAGA hats and other political t-shirts. To my great amusement, my hosts got around this policy by wearing a jacket over their political t-shirts inside of residence halls. Every time we stepped outside, my 80 and even 90 year old hosts took off their jackets and proudly showed me their Harris Walls t-shirts and Black Lives Matter t-shirts. 
I'm not going to lie, I thought that was pretty clever. The, normal, the normalization of the morally extraordinary in fascist politics is often enabled by discourses of dehumanization. Over the past month, I've sat in disbelief as Haitian migrants who are here legally are baselessly accused of eating people's pets in Springfield, Ohio. The baseless conspiracy has resulted in multiple bomb threats and the closure of offices, schools, and even universities. To be clear, dehumanizing immigrants is nothing new inside of what Jeff, author Jeff Charlotte calls the Trumpocene. The Trumpocene is a jargony technical term for capturing a space where white grievances, conspiracy theories, and anti-immigrant fervor flourish. To jog your memory, Trump actually began his 2016 presidential campaign by stoking these grievances. As one rally goer put it, it was like story time with Trump. This was no ordinary children's story time though, as Trump built up to the reading with anti-immigrant rhetoric against Syrian and Mexican immigrants. After whipping up his audience's fears, Trump read The Snake Out Loud, a story of a tender-hearted woman who shows empathy to a half-frozen snake crying out in profound need on the side of the road. The snake says, take me in, O tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O tender woman, cried the snake. The woman obliges, and after warming the snake up in her home, the snake uh, turns around after she's stroking his skin and proceeds to bite her. The lyrics provided Trump with a kind of elusive allegory. The generous woman represents those who welcome immigrants. The snake represents poisonous immigrants. To loud cheers, Trump amplified the innuendo. Quote, does that make sense to anybody? Does that make any sense? We have no idea who we are taking in, and we better be careful. Ironically, the snake was written by Oscar Brown, who was a member of the Communist Party, a black nationalist, and a civil rights activist. One of Brown's daughters likened Trump's reappropriation of her father's song to a lynching scene. And even after Brown's daughter sent a cease and desist letter, Trump proceeded to recite the, the snake to mark his 100th day in office. The psychological effects of dehumanizing rhetoric are exacerbated by social media. Recent scholarship on dehumanization suggests that consistent and repeated exposure to animalistic dehumanization can potentially alter our worldview and our behavior without our awareness. Together, Trump's dehumanizing rhetoric contributed to trickle-down bigotry and the largest spike in hate crimes since the 9-11 terror attacks. Notably, surges in crime were felt the most in counties where Trump held a political rally. Dehumanization in the Trumpocene can also cultivate what psychologists call moral disengagement. To be sure, in August of 2019, a 21-year-old white man and self-proclaimed Christian, according to his Twitter bio, drove 10 hours to El Paso, Texas, and murdered, and murdered 20 people in a Walmart with an AR-15. Minutes before the terror attack, the shooter posted a hate-filled manifesto that mirrors the Trumpocene xenophobia. He wrote, this attack is a response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas. Friends, trickle-down bigotry is deadly. In a moment when Christians and churches have become incubators for fascist politics in the United States and abroad, now is not a time for both sides preaching or passive silence in the face of anti-immigrant dehumanization. According to the Public Religion Research Institute, this anti-immigrant sentiment is especially present among, wait for it, white Christians who look like me. In fact, 32% of Americans affirm the statement that immigrants are invading our country and replacing our cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Among white adherents of Christian nationalism, 
this number goes up to 81%. We call this conspiracy theory replacement theory, and at this moment, 165 members of the United States Congress have publicly expressed sympathy for this dehumanizing conspiracy. The dehumanization of immigrants is anti-gospel. I know that it is anti-gospel because a centering and central conviction of the Christian faith across space and time is that all of humanity is created in God's image. This, of course, includes our Haitian brothers and sisters. But before I define Christian nationalism, I want to make four brief points. I want to be clear about four things. First, this is a Christian problem. Adherents of Christian nationalism are twice as likely as other people in our country to report attending religious services at least twice a month. Secondly, I think that congregations are ground zero for mobilizing a challenger movement against Christian nationalism. Yes, some congregations are a part of the problem, but many congregations are and can become a part of the solution. Third, mocking Christian nationalists as stupid, isolated, and crazy is not a serious or sincere strategy of protest. And fourth, dehumanizing the dehumanizer has the obverse effect of dehumanizing oneself. Friends, we need a better way for thinking about this. Three and a half years ago, my colleagues in the Church Leadership Center at AMBS asked me to do a one-hour webinar on challenging Christian nationalism. I eagerly agreed with the expectation that maybe 20 or 30 pastors would show up. And so when 1,400 people registered for this webinar, I was overwhelmed by the church's need for resources. Strange Worship and the Six Steps for Challenging Christian Nationalism emerged out of this webinar. I regret that I won't have time to unpack all of these steps tonight, but I do want to hat tip them very briefly. Step one is to break silence in our communities, because silence before theologies of oppression is a form of compliance. Step two is to check our posture, our posture toward injustice, and to harness our anger at injustice in a posture of lament. The lament tradition in the Hebrew Bible gives us permission to be angry at God about injustice and permission to be angry at God about our neighbor's behavior with regard to injustice. It's okay to be angry at injustice. It's a question of how we harness that anger. The third step is to define white Christian nationalism and educate others so that we can name the objects of our resistance. I will spend a fair amount of time on that tonight. Step four is to name white Christian nationalism as a form of political idolatry. Step five is to preach the whole life of Jesus as a counter-narrative or what I'm going to call tonight inoculative messaging. <clears throat> And step six is to mobilize congregations as sites to nonviolently and creatively leverage people power for the common good and become spaces for recovery. In the word recovery there, I mean it in the full sense of the word. I mean this as an off-ramp for those who are de-radicalizing and in need of a spiritual sobriety. I wonder how the church can offer that kind of space in safe ways. So what is white Christian nationalism? Among Christian groups who present an acute threat to democracy in the church's witness, those who ascribe to soft and hard versions of Christian nationalism stand out for their willingness to instrumentalize democratic backsliding through conspiracy theories and the breaking of democratic norms. According to PRRI, 85% of adherents of Christian nationalism agree or mostly agree that God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. This jarring data point with its emphasis on all areas of American life is a reminder that Christian nationalism and what we call Christian dominionism are interrelated and overlapping forms of power worship. 
The porous boundary between Christian nationalism and Christian dominionism calls for definitional clarity and carefully constructed taxonomies, the latter of which is just now getting underway by scholars of religion. Capturing the moving parts of Christian nationalism with one singular descriptor is difficult and fraught with nuances that can be hard to capture. This is especially true as terms like Christian nationalism are co-opted and weaponized by adherents and sympathizers of Christian nationalism. Moreover, depending on the pundit, terms like evangelical, Christian supremacy, right-winger, Republican, and Christo-fascist are used to talk about similar moving parts, but not always the same thing. For my purposes here, I use the term Christian nationalism as an umbrella term to capture the pervasive myth among Americans that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation and should be a Christian nation. Notably, 96% of Christian nationalism adherents agree or mostly agree that the U.S. government should declare the United States a Christian nation. This is compared to only 22% of all Americans who affirm this statement. Sociologists like Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry have helpfully popularized the descriptor Christian nationalism to capture this founding myth and show that Christian nationalism's controlling narrative is something much deeper than religion in the strict sense. Indeed, they argue that it is as ethnic as it is political and includes assumptions of nativism, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, along with divine sanction for authoritarian control and militarism. A really helpful contribution of Whitehead and Perry's study for Christians challenging Christian nationalism is their observation that there are four postures toward Christian nationalism among Americans. They observe that there's one group called rejectors of Christian nationalism. They make up about 21% of U.S. society. They observe that there is a group called resistors. This is, makes up about 26.6% of U.S. society. Accommodator, accommodators make up 32% of U.S. society, and ambassadors make up 19.8% of U.S. society. Just so that you don't get confused, the Public Religion Research Institute recently changed this taxonomy from resistors to skeptics, from accommodators to sympathizers, and from ambassadors to adherents, but they're all talking about basically the same thing. Even though ambassadors and adherents make up the smallest group of Americans, they have an outsized amount of power in our political system due to gerrymandering and the ways that congressional representation works in our country. Moreover, Whitehead and Perry showed that key predictors of ambassadors are identification with political conservatism, belief in the Bible as the literal word of God, religious practice, belief that the founding fathers were Christians, belief that America is on the brink of moral decay, belief that God requires the faithful to wage war for good. Only 16% of ambassadors of Christian nationalism reside in cities. That's something we need to have serious conversations about. And they tend to believe in the rapture, even though the word rapture does not occur in the New Testament. More recently, in their book, The Flag and the Cross, Philip Gorski and Samuel Perry observe a cause and effect relationship between whiteness and direct violence. Based on uh, public polling, they argue that the more that white Americans seek to institutionalize Christian values or the nation's Christian identity, the more strongly they support gun-toting good guys, taking on real or imagined gun-toting bad guys, the more frequent use of the death penalty, any means necessary policing, and even torture as an interrogation technique. It is true that American evangelicalism has become a major vector for white Christian nationalism. 64% of white evangelicals are adherents and sympathizers of Christian nationalism. It is not true, though, that all evangelicals are Christian nationalists. This distinction is important as our descriptors are in constant danger of essentializing 
whole people groups. Still, the confluence between evangelicalism and Christian nationalism has been, been many years in the making, with the result that white Protestant evangelicals are more supportive of Christian nationalism than any other group. Now, this is where things get tricky. To be clear, when we talk about white Christian nationalism, we are not always talking about tax-evading neo-Nazi paramilitary organizations, but we could be depending on our referent. The spectrum between soft, hard, and extremist versions of Christian nationalism is messy and defies binary analyses, including among adherents on a spectrum of radicalization that can extend to violent extremism. Still, I contend that a central and unifying theology of power and soteriology unifies soft and hard, including extremist versions of Christian nationalism. To illustrate this, I appeal to sociologist James Aho's 1990 definition of a Christian patriot as a person who assents to faith in Jesus Christ as savior, either through his example or through his sacrifice, believes that the promise of salvation has been given to all human beings, believes that only through Jesus Christ can one be saved, feels duty bound to reform the world after God's will as discerned in the Bible and as manifested in the Constitution, has a moral obligation to submit to secular authority that rules according to God's will as understood above, believes a secret satanic conspiracy has infiltrated America's major institutions to subvert God's will, and finally believes that the actions and policies of these subverted institutions must be battled by means of a politics of righteousness. Strikingly, Aho's definition well captures the theological convictions of millions of evangelical adherents and sympathizers of Christian nationalism in the U.S. today, but that is not who Aho is talking about. Rather, Aho is describing the theological worldview of Idaho Christian patriots after conducting 520 interviews in the 1980s with extremist members of the Aryan Nation's Church, the Order, and other tax-evading, white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and vigilante armed groups. The theology of power, conspiracy, and activism are the same, um, but the expression and level of radicalization and extremism are different. More so, Idaho Christian patriots uh, in the early 90s largely operated on the fringes of society in the seclusion of compounds in the wilderness. I know this because I spent most of my childhood there. Not so, though, anymore. As Aho observes in a publication of his from two years ago, he says one of the most historically significant and interesting outcomes of the years after 2010 has been the unapologetic embracement of elements of Christian dominionism doctrine and policies by leading figures in the Republican Party. White Christian nationalism's theology of power offers a permission structure for American xenophobia and Christian supremacy to come out of the shadows of compounds in the wilderness into everyday life. This xenophobic gospel of power worship has found a home in churches, the Republican Party, the Trumpocene, in particular ways of using, and I would argue, abusing the Bible. To understand white Christian nationalism's theology of power, another slippery term requires further reflection. That term is Christian dominionism. Until recently, the decentralization and institutional diffusion of Christian dominionism allowed it to go largely undetected by scholars and even dismissed by a whole lot of journalists. Julie Ingersoll is among a handful of scholars who wrote on the influence of Christian dominionism on our political system in the early 2010s, admitting that its influence is subtle, implicit, and hidden. 
Fast forward to January 6, 2021, and the influence of Christian dominionism spilled over into public view on national television as a hodgepodge of Christian dominionists helped facilitate a full-blown insurrection uh, emboldened by Trump's big lie and a perceived loss of status in the wake of the election of America's first African-American president, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the legalization of same-sex marriage through Obergefell v. Hodges, among other demographic shifts. Like the term Christian nationalism, Christian dominionism is a crucial but messy descriptor that seeks to capture a broad array of diverse Christian coalitions and actors. Despite its diversity, a unifying biblical thread can be discerned among Christian dominionists in Genesis 1.28, which says this, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The passage is read by dominionists as a biblical mandate to exercise dominion over the nations. Ingersoll shows that the goal is, quote, the complete transformation of every aspect of culture to bring it under the authority of biblical law, which they understand as speaking to every area of life. While our taxonomies are becoming more sophisticated for analyzing Christian dominionism, three networks stand out for their ongoing influence on Christian nationalism in the United States today. The first network is R.J. Rushduni's writings um, uh, during the Re Christian Reconstruction Movement during the 1970s and 1980s. I regret I will not have time to unpack Rushduni's impact tonight. The second network is Peter Wagner and the New Apostolic Reformation. Some of you may have heard this phrase, New Apostolic Reformation, in the news recently for very good reasons. Third is the emerging influence of what I'm calling Dominionist White Christian Nationalist Theobros. Here, I wish to offer a brief overview of these movements' theology of power. One of the fastest growing and underreported Christian movements in the United States is called the New Apostolic Reformation. It is abbreviated NAR. NAR is a loose collection of neo-charismatic Pentecostal churches that embrace Christian dominionism. The impact of NAR is felt through what Matthew Taylor calls a charismatic spiritual oligarchy of self-described prophets, apostles, worship leaders, and social media influencers who've aligned themselves with right-wing politicians to take dominion over demonic spheres of purported spiritual influence inside of the U.S. government. This is why at least one Catholic priest performed an exorcism on January 6, 2021 inside of the United States Capitol building because he was exercising demons that he believed were inhabiting liberal politicians. Notably, key NAR leaders attended high-level meetings in the Trump administration's White House in the days and hours leading up to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Strikingly, none of these Christian charlatans are being held accountable for uh, their contributions to the insurrection in the, in the Joint Committee's investigation on January 6th. NAR finds its origins in a fuller theological professor uh, of missiology named Peter Wagner. For Wagner, NAR is a term he coined to describe churches living in what he calls the Second Apostolic Age, which, according to his calculations, arbitrarily began in 2001. Wagner's date was many years in the making through Pentecostalism's rediscovery of the Holy Spirit throughout the 20th century and what Wagner calls a paradigm-shifting emphasis in the fivefold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers from Ephesians 4.11. The result, according to Wagner, is the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. 
he goes on to say it may even be greater than the Reformation. As the second apostolic age progresses, <clears throat> Wagner believes that theologians per se will become relics of the past since they are not mentioned in Ephesians 4.11, with apologies to my colleagues. With some polemic against his evangelical, evangelical interlocutors, he looks down on the term kingdom theology, preferring the term dominion theology as more action-based, more aggressive, and more biblically comprehensive. The action bias of NAR is portrayed by Wagner as a cosmic battle with Satan through apostolic networks that also serve as what he calls spiritual warfare networks. Like other NAR leaders, Wagner looks down on evangelicals who expect the world to deteriorate while uh, obsessing over escaping through planet Earth through the rapture. Many of you grew up in the 1970s and 80s and 90s uh, when, when uh, books like Hal Lindsey's Great Late Planet Earth and Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins uh, wrote the uh, Left Behind series. All of that end times vision was built on what we call premillennial dispensationalism. And at the heart of this theology was a, 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 an expectation that there will be a rapture and we all need to be patiently waiting for this rapture to take place. Here, though, Wagner admits his own conversion from premillennial dispensationalism to what we call postmillennialism, which is a technical term for Christians who believe they are called to take charge of the world now for Christ instead of waiting around for Jesus' return. Evangelicalism in the United States is experiencing one of its most rapid mutations right now as millions of evangelicals are adopting a post-millennial eschatology of coercion and domination as they grab onto this vision of, of being given a divine mandate to take dominion over the nations now. Wagner even animates the intensity of this sought-after end-time social transformation through language of colonization, war, prosperity, and eschatological transfers of wealth to Christ's followers in his writings. Wagner openly acknowledges that his emphasis on spiritual warfare landed him in hot water with his colleagues at Fuller Seminary. But this did not detract him and others from developing Christian dominionism in even more coercive ways. This was already underway in 1975 when Dr. Bill Bright, the president of Campus Crusade for Christ, was praying about how to turn the world back to Jesus. While in prayer, Bright claims to have experienced a divine vision of seven spheres of influence, the church, family, education, government and law, media, arts, and business. The day after this vision, Bright says he met with the founder of Youth with a Mission named Lauren Cunningham, who also claims to have experienced this same vision. The facts of this meeting are of course disputed, but Bright and Cunningham's shared vision of seven spheres of influence gave birth to a more top-down transformation of Christian dominionism. Bright and Cunningham's seven spheres of dominion went global through missionaries and charismatic leaders in the 1980s and 1990s. But it wasn't until the year 2000 that these seven spheres of influence took on an even more coercive dimension. In the year 2000, Lance Wallnau, who was a Pentecostal businessman turned pastor, prophet, motivational speaker, and social media charlatan with a fake PhD, met with Lauren Cunningham, who taught him about the seven spheres of influence. Wallnau claims that his life was changed by Cunningham's vision, but instead of interpreting the vision as seven spheres of cultural influence, Wallnau saw them as high mountains to be subdued for Christ. Wallnau's reinterpretation of the seven spheres of influence led to the now widely popular Seven Mountain Mandate, a theology of power that seeks to enshrine Christian supremacy on the seven mountains of culture that are demonically possessed. To give you an idea of how globally influential this movement is, 
I was in Ethiopia a few months ago teaching at the Mennonite seminary there. There are more Mennonites in, in the country of Ethiopia than any other country in the world. And my students asked me to come early before class started to speak at a conference on Christian nationalism in the eastern part of Ethiopia near Somalia. Well, as I got into my lectures, I spent a whole hour talking about Christian dominionism. And at one point, I just thought, you know, I'm curious. How many of you have heard of the New Apostolic Reformation and the Seven Mountain Mandate? Instantly, 85% of the room of about 100 pastors raised their hands. To be clear, this idea did not come from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It did not come from the New Testament. It did not come from early Christian missionaries. It came from new apostolic missionaries from the United States of America. For Wall now, these mountain kings don't have to be virtuous, but they do have to be competent. This is not a culture of sheep, he writes. It is a culture of wolves. Published in 2013, these words foreshadow Walnell's full-throated endorsement of Donald Trump through a book he wrote in about 2014. Walnell argues that Trump is a modern-day Cyrus who can influence the mountains of business and media, an apologetic move that Wagner also makes on his deathbed in an op-ed in 2016. Here, Peter Wagner writes, I want to vote for a commander-in-chief not a bishop-in-chief. Lest one think that Lance Wallnau is a fringe influencer, he has over one million followers on Facebook where he regularly imbibes in conspiracy theories, the big lie, and prophecies about current events on his own live streaming newscast in his basement. Last week, in fact, Lance Wallnau hosted vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance for a town hall. Let me say that one more time, so we all get that. Let's let that soak in for a minute. Last week, Lance Wallnau, the godfather of the Seven Mountain Mandate, hosted vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance for a publicized, televised town hall, despite being a key architect of spreading conspiracies about a stolen election during the events leading up to January 6th, including through swing state prayer and prophecy tours. Let's just all just take a quick breath here. I'm sharing some heavy stuff. Just take a deep breath. My goal tonight is not to, to, to overwhelm you with information and, and bad news. There's a lot of good news, too, to talk about. Um, but a couple of months ago, Matthew Taylor and another a political scientist or sociologist, I can't remember, named Paul Juppe, published some new data showing that 30% of American Christians affirmed their belief in the Seven Mountain Mandate in 2023, but that number has grown to 41% in 2024. My point is that no matter who wins this election, the New Apostolic Reformation, Christian Dominionism, the Seven Mountain Mandate has some sticking power, and we need to be aware of these networks, and we need to talk about them. Thankfully, we have good resources for understanding this movement. I think about five days ago, my colleague Matthew Taylor in Baltimore published this magnificent book, The Violent Take It by Force, The Christian Movement That is Threatening Our Democracy. This is the first major deep dive on the psychology and personalities and history of major New Apostolic Reformation leaders who were involved with the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Really briefly, on Twitter a few weeks ago, Dr. Taylor posted this graphic that really helpfully visualizes the ways that New Apostolic Reformation apostles and prophets were prophesying about the 2020 election and then organized a major return to the National Mall and then had major worship events. And all of this time, they were partaking in spiritual warfare campaigns leading up to the election. Then after the election, they went on swing state Jericho marches and continued peddling conspiracy theories and participating in spiritual war warfare campaigns, all leading up to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. I share this visual with you briefly to remind you that this exact same playbook is happening right now. Again, no matter who wins on November 5th, this playbook is going to be used again, and we need to be prepared for this. We need to have preemptive strategies in place 
for mobilizing a nonviolent civil resistance movement. And to give you an idea of just how high up in the United States government these ideas have penetrated, some of you may have heard that when this, the new speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, uh, moved into his office, he placed an appeal to heaven flag outside of his door. Any of you hear about this? The appeal to heaven flag comes from the Revolutionary War, and the phrase appeal to heaven comes from the philosopher John Locke. But uh, in, in the 2010s, a new apostolic reformation uh, apostle named Dutch Sheets wrote a book about this flag and claimed it for right-wing insurgent movements, all with the premise of institutionalizing a Christian nation that is homogenous. Notably, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito was also caught recently flying this flag at his vacation property. More recently, a new generation of relatively young, educated, and reformed white Christian men are mobilizing churches to take dominion over the U.S. These men are not always charismatics, but they idolize reformers like Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin, including their proclivities to enact violence on heretics. Because of their John Wayne-style masculinity and sense of entitlement as the theological warriors taking down women on Twitter, they've earned the moniker Theobros. Theobros are especially influential in well-funded infrastructure inside of unorthodox spaces like Prager University, Gab.com, and Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA. Here I wish to brief briefly focus on Andrew Torba and Andrew Eisker's 2022 book, A Biblical Guide to Taking Dominion and Discipling Nations. The book offers a full-throated apologetic for dominionist Christian nationalism. Torba and Eisker define Christian nationalism as a spiritual, political, and cultural movement comprised of Christians who are working to build a Christian society grounded in a biblical worldview. They do not elaborate on what they mean by a biblical worldview, but key to their vision is a belief that the U.S. is currently facing the righteous judgment of God since tolerance for evil has allowed subversive agents of Satan, in their words, to invade every facet of our country. Provocatively, they argue that Christian nationalism is, quote, loving your neighbor and is, quote, not idolatry. By neighbor, they mean fellow citizens and brothers and sisters um, who Christians are called to protect from foreign interests, alien worldviews, and hostile invaders. To resist foreign influencers, presumably immigrants and liberals, and subversive agents of Satan, they argued that, quote, Jesus did not command us to sit around getting crushed by Satan waiting to die. He commanded us to make disciples of all nations, and we need to take dominion in his name. The time for being a Christian wimp is over. Now is the time for a masculine, patriarchic, crusader, Jesus is King Christian revival. Clearly, these are post-millennial uh, uh, thinkers with regard to the end time. They believe they've been given a divine mandate that they are living in the end times and they are to take charge of planet Earth now. To meet this moment, or better, maybe I should say, to confront this moment, we need to have some hard conversations about political idolatry. So often in the church, we are taught to think that idolatry is only something that happens in the sphere of religion. But according to the Old and New Testaments, idolatry is something that also happens in the sphere of the political. In ancient Judaism, idolatry was not something that happened in your heart. It was something that happened in your head. Simply put, Idolatry is an erroneous perception of God in the mind of the worshiper. How we think about God matters, and how we think about our neighbors matters for how we think about God. In ancient Judaism, rabbis called the worship of another god, a king, or empire a form of strange worship, or in Hebrew, avodah zarah, which of course is the title of my book. 
One of the most profound things I learned over the past four years, at least profound to me, subjectively speaking, is that becoming an idolater of power or becoming radicalized is not something that happens overnight. Becoming an idolater of power or becoming radicalized into violent extremism is a process and not a moment. No one becomes an idolater in their sleep overnight. I like how theologian Stephen Fowle puts this. He writes that idolatry is the result of a number of small incremental moves, a set of seemingly benign or even prudent decisions, a set of habits and dispositions, often acquired through subtle participation in a wider culture, a set of influential friendships. All of these work in complex combinations, gradually to direct our attention slowly and almost imperceptibly away from the one true God towards that which is not God. Idolatry and radicalization is a process and not a moment. According to the National Consortium for their study of terrorism and responses to terrorism in the United States, domestic extremists in the U.S radicalize on average in a period of five years from the point of exposure to radical ideas and the point of committing violent crime. I see this, pastorally speaking, as good news. This means we have five years to intervene and to get in the way of processes that lead to violent extremism. This image here is of a capital insurrectionist of Josiah Colt, a young 20-something a year old man who showed up to the January 6th insurrection ready for what he calls a boogaloo, which is a right wing code word for a civil war. When he was interrogated by a judge on trial for uh, breaking into the United States Capitol, he looked at the judge and simply said, you know, I got caught up in the moment. When idolaters of power get caught up in the moment, there's no turning back. And so as we're thinking of realistic strategies of protest against Christian nationalism, I'm far less concerned with mobilizing a challenger movement against idolaters of power, and I'm far more concerned with creatively coming up with interventions that disrupt radicalization before it even happens. Disturbingly, we know that those who are adherents of QAnon conspiracy theories radicalize in a much quicker amount of time. In fact, 64% of QAnon adherents who committed violent crimes radicalized in less than one year. In other words, adherence to the QAnon conspiracy theory contributes to a kind of accelerationism, a kind of accelerationist violence. And on a pastoral note, it's worth noting, and please hear this carefully, that 41% of the 44 QAnon offenders who committed violent crimes before and after the January 6th insurrection radicalized after experiencing trauma, including PTSD from military service, sexualized or physical violence, or the premature death of loved ones. Moreover, 60% of the 44 QAnon offenders have documented mental health concerns. I share that as an invitation to embrace a posture of empathy. As Pamela Cooper White argues, empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. In my book, I call this empathic resistance as we're thinking about dialogue with those who become radicalized. Ken recognizing that there is a mental health crisis among idolaters of power help us as the church to resist this with empathic resistance. All of this, of course, is especially concerning because we know from public polling that Americans' adherence to QAnon is only growing. In 2021, 14% of all Americans affirmed QAnon conspiracy theories. This number has grown to 23% of all Americans in 2023. That's roughly one in four of your neighbors right now who affirm QAnon conspiracy theories, which is like pouring gasoline on processes of radicalization. 
Scholars conceptualize the process of of developing extremist beliefs, emotions, and behaviors in four stages. Pre-radicalization is stage one. Detachment is stage two. Peer immersion and training is stage three. And planning and execution of violent action is stage four. For obvious reasons, intelligence agencies are almost exclusively focused on identifying actors at the immersion and planning stages of committing terrorism. In fact, billions of dollars have been funneled into counterterrorism programs since the 9-11 terror attacks. I have learned more from this scholarship, from human security studies scholars, from radicalization studies scholars, and peace studies scholars than any theologian, political scientist, or sociologist about how to challenge Christian nationalism. Now, what's interesting about this is that for roughly 20 years, these scholars were almost exclusively focused on uh, Islamist violent extremism. Well, all of a sudden, when Trump was elected, they said, whoa, hold up. Everything we've been talking about with regard to programs of de-radicalization is happening under our own feet right here in the United States. And so there's this seismic shift taking place in the disciplines of human security and peace studies where we're now taking this content, many of which was used for very Islamophobic purposes and carceral purposes, and we're trying to think ethically how we can use that material to challenge domestic extremism in the United States. To be clear, in contrast to how governments are approaching this, I'm interested in preemptive interventions that disrupt processes of radicalization in stages one and two to disorient radicalization before it leads to stages of immersion and planning violent action. While theology is not a singular driver for radicalization, it can be a component of one's pathway to violent extremism. Therefore, I think that theologians, pastors, and biblical scholars are uniquely positioned to theorize and implement interventions within a distinctively Christian vernacular. To close tonight, I want to share five interventions that I would invite us to be thinking about in community with one another. The first intervention is to see congregations as a site to educate on how to detect fake news and also to disrupt misinformation and conspiracy theories in our communities. We know that fake news travels six times faster than true news on the internet. We know that tech oligarchs have designed algorithms that hack our brains for cash. These can very quickly become addicting because they create a dopamine feedback loop as people are sharing fake news in the midst of division and polarization. How can congregations engage this space and interrupt processes of radicalization online by creating spaces, possibly even on Sunday mornings, to talk about our habits on social media? Second, many of you may be aware that according to the United States Surgeon General, we are living in an epidemic of loneliness. Last year, the U.S. Surgeon General's team of cardiovascular surgeons and neuroscientists and psychologists and other thinkers came together and discerned that Americans are living in an epidemic of loneliness. They argue in their report that the risk of premature death posed by social disconnection is similar to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than obesity and physical activity. They show that time spent with friends in the U.S. has declined 20 hours a month between 2003 and 2020. They show that time spent alone increased by 24 hours a month in that period, and that Americans are sick, angry, and alone, and that we are living in a culture of fear. The famous philosopher Hannah Arendt, in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, also observes during World War II, during the Nazi regime, a cause and effect relationship between isolation and loneliness and radicalization. This is something I wonder about often. 
can churches rethink why we gather together in community? Yes, of course, we gather together as the people of God to worship God, to participate in the sacraments, to participate in our liturgies, but we also participate to mobilize, mobilize this need for human connection as a strategy to harness sin, hold it at bay, and to create spaces of connection and de-radicalize those who might be on a pathway in a process to political idolatry. Third, we need to think critically about what it means to teach the whole life of Jesus as a counter-narrative. And I would argue that this is the most important thing we can do in this moment. This is especially important because Christian nationalists tend to lean very heavily on the Great Commission in Matthew 28. They love this saying of Jesus that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. They see that as a transfer of power to themselves, a divine mandate to take over the nations, but they never go on to talk about what Jesus goes on to say, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. This includes the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teachings on power, Jesus' teachings on boundaries and order, including inclusive table fellowship, Jesus' teachings on money, and Jesus' teachings on violence and peacemaking. One's radicalization is impossible without exposure to dangerous speech and narratives that sow extremist ideas. Dominionist Christian nationalists lean heavily on narratives and social media to spread their ideology and attract and recruit followers through family associations, online recruitment, religious sites, and prisons. For this reason, some scholars prefer to use the language of recruitment rather than radicalization. Narratives are a powerful recruitment tool because they can be wielded to call the vulnerable persons to action through a sense of duty, victimization, religious reward, belonging, sense of purpose, and a desire for adventure. More so, narratives can nurture identification with bad actors, offer a kind of psychological transportation to persuade beliefs and attitudes, and cultivate associations with parasocial relationships or characters who, who listeners and readers see as influential and trusted peers. Recent scholarship has shown that extremist recruitment narratives can be challenged through counter-narratives or attitudinal inoculative messaging. Counter-narratives can also be thought of as a kind of counter-recruitment. We even have empirical evidence that counter-narratives work to curtail psychological reactants to extremist narratives. For example, in 2018, Kurt Braddock exposed 357 participants to inoculative messaging before reading left or right-wing propaganda. Braddock found that inoculation negatively predicted perceptions of an extremist group's credibility. While Christian nationalism is not a terrorist organization, it leans heavily on narratives that radicalize and recruit willing listeners. The same is true for the Trumpocene, wherein recruitment narratives are disseminated through a constellation of right-wing media actors. These recruitment narratives are intensified by a soteriology, missional ambition, and apocalyptic worldview that leaves little room for mystery. Either one is going to heaven or hell, and America is on the brink of God's righteous judgment. Such messaging often errs on the side of manipulation as listeners are invited to associate with a hodgepodge of biblical characters to analogize their plight as a faithful and even theologically persecuted remnant. To effectively counter these recruitment narratives, we first need to understand them. This means creating intentional spaces for scholars, faith leaders, and students to step out of the comfort of our own theology information silos to listen to and analyze the narrative theology that funds Christian dominionism. For example, in sermons, talk radio, TikToks, and social media accounts. 
After analyzing and identifying key themes in this material, we can build counter themes in narratives that target radicalizing motifs. Key to the success of advocating for an alternative view, according to Braddock, is choosing the right messengers and locales for dissemination. Admittedly, this is unexplored space, but a space where holding one's ideological cards close to their chest may be important to avoid instant delegitimization. Moreover, it is crucial to identify messengers with a degree of Christian or pastoral and priestly credibility who can articulate counter narratives through cr close readings of the Bible and the life and teachings of Jesus. Alternatively, anonymous counter narratives disseminated through memes and other platforms on social media that advocate for God's love for all creation can help to inoculate against Christian supremacy's exclusive vision of belonging that contributes to democratic backsliding. The operative word here is to experiment, and I fully recognize that not all of us are called to this kind of work. Finally, we need to have some hard conversations about biblical authoritarianism. The Bible is a shared sacred text for Christian nationalists and Christians challenging Christian nationalism. Pundits often blame Christian nationalist radicalization on evangelicalism, the Republican Party, Fox News, and Trump. No question, these are all legitimate vectors for radicalization. However, an equally, if not more influential medium for radicalization is what I call biblical authoritarianism, since the Bible, broadly speaking, is a more influential medium for uh, those who are, are, are peddling these kinds of platforms, for those who are drawing on random biblical verses to proof text and legitimate their Christian dominionist worldview. And so I have come to the conviction that biblical interpretation deserves a place at the table of human security studies because biblical interpretation is a human security issue. Finally, and the fifth thing we can do is reclaim the peace roots of the early church. According to the New Testament, there is no such thing as a Christian nation because the only Christian nation in the world is what the New Testament calls in Greek the ecclesia, or the gathered community of Jesus' followers. And in its ideal form, the ecclesia is borderless, weaponless, and made up of peoples of all nations. And so we, we embrace the peace witness of the church because it was the way of Jesus and the way of the earliest church, but we also embrace the peace tradition because we know that it is more effective at affecting change in society than violence. In their book, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, sorry, the short title is Why Civil Resistance Works, written by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, they analyzed 323 violent and nonviolent resistance campaigns between 1900 and 2006 that had at least 1,000 or more participants. And what they found is stunning. They found that nonviolent movements were twice as successful as violent ones. Even more compelling, the long-term consequences of nonviolent movements led toward democracy, while violent revolutions, whether failed or successful, increased the chances of civil wars or dictatorships. They show in their research that there are three main ingredients for a successful nonviolent civil resistance campaign. Broad participation by diverse groups, shifting tactics that build pressure while minimizing repression, and shifts in loyalties within key pillars of an opponent's power. Perhaps most significantly, they found that no single campaign has failed during the time period after they achieved the active and sustained participation of just 3.5% of the population. Every campaign that made it over 3.5% was a nonviolent one and also a violent one. In other words, resistance begets resistance broad participation increases success rates. And so we embrace and reclaim the peace witness of the church because it was the way of Jesus and the way of the early church. We also do that because we know that it is more strategic and successful than violent resistance. In summary, 
here are some pre-interventions that can interrupt processes that lead to radicalization. First, break silence and educate our communities about Christian nationalism, Christian dominionism, and the new apostolic reformation. Second, help educate about fake news and interrupt online disinformation and conspiracy theories among family and friends with curiosity, empathy, and self-control, but only when it is safe to do so. I talk much more about these boundaries in my book. Third, build community to counter the loneliness pandemic. Fourth, scale up counter narratives by telling the whole life of Jesus. Fifth, challenge biblical authoritarianism with more responsible, Christ-centered, and life-giving ways of reading the Bible for the common good. And sixth, reclaim the peace roots of the early church. I'm mindful that I've gone over time a bit tonight. Thank you so much for, for hanging with me. But I want to close on this point. To meet this moment, we need truth tellers. We also need peacemakers and peace builders. But I also think that to meet this moment, we need hope makers. I like how theologian Willie Jennings puts this. Hope is a discipline. It is not a sentiment. On our own, we don't have much power, but together we are powerful. When we participate, when participation increases in a challenger movement, success rates also increase. May God give each of us the courage, comfort, and wisdom we need as we mobilize a peace-building movement against white Christian nationalism. Thank you. for your courage to take on a topic like this at a time like this. We need it so much, and I am inspired again tonight. My name is Jewel Gingrich Langenecker. I'm the Dean of Lifelong Learning at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, also the Director of the Doctor of Ministry Program, and also a member of Kern Road here alongside True. You gave us a lot to think about tonight. But I know that what you said tonight is just the beginning, just the tip of the iceberg of what you know and what you've learned about this topic over the last four years. And so um, with that in mind, I wanna note that we have opportunities to um, purchase a copy of Drew's book at the back, Strange Worship, Six Steps for Challenging Christian Nationalism. You can stop by the book table after the service or after um, we dismiss. And um, if you don't have cash to pay for it, they're gonna ask you to use a QR code to use your phone to purchase it online, or to pay for it online. You can take your book with you tonight, get it signed, but you can um, use your, your phone to pay. If you're interested in mobilizing Christian leaders or Christian congregations to counter violent extremism and political idolatry, we hope that you will consider studying with us at AMBS. With uh, perhaps the oldest or close to the oldest peace studies program in the United States at AMBS, we think we're uniquely prepared to raise leaders for this moment. And so to that end, um, beginning October 23, AMBS is offering an online short course taught by Drew that will go deeper into this topic and will use his new book as the textbook for the short course. It's open to anyone who's interested, regardless of your educational background. It's six weeks long, fully online, not for credit, and involves no grades and no papers. It's also affordable. At just $350, all of our short courses are affordable. But we also have a special deal for you tonight. And that is if you register any time in the next week using the promotional code that I will give you in a second, 
If you use that to register, you can save $50 on your registration for this short course. And to do that, just go to our website, ambs.edu, and search short courses. And then when you're registering, you'll be asked to indicate, how did you hear about this? How did you hear about this short course? Choose public lecture, and then here's the promo code, Kern Deal. Kern, K-E-R-N, Deal, D-E-A-L. So if you do that any time in the next week, you'll save $50 on your registration. Um, in addition, Drew and all of our fine professors at AMBS teach full-length seminary courses, many of which are open to the public. And next semester, Drew will be teaching a class called Apocalypse Against Empire, the Book of Revelation. That class is happening on Friday afternoons, and you can join it in person or on Zoom. What a great way to start your weekend. <laughs> and in addition to all of our regular courses, we also offer practical leadership training modules, support circles for pastors, extensive leadership development programs, and several other short courses. So to sign up for a class or see what else we've got lined up, you can stop by our display back here. We'll have our Director of Enrollment, Marianne Weber, there to answer questions. And of course, you can always go on to our website. And finally, if you want to support what we're up to at AMBS, we invite you to go to our website, ambs.edu slash donate, and contribute a gift. Keep this kind of work going. So at this time, we invite you to enjoy refreshments. Um, there's drinks around the table, around the corner, and snacks at the back. Get your copy of Strange Worship. Stop by the table, get it signed, chat with each other, enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you so much for coming out tonight.